All right. Well, I assume that uh, people are still adding, but we're at the seven o'clock hour. So maybe I'll go ahead and get things started. So welcome, everyone. I'm glad you can join us tonight for the Science Museum lecture, um, the last one of our lecture series this fall. We will have uh, a new schedule coming out, hopefully in early January for uh, a lineup in the spring. Uh, my name is Scott Newbold. I'm a member of the biology faculty at Sheridan College, and I help coordinate the Science Museum Lecture Series. And um, as ever, we are very grateful to the Sheridan College Foundation and the Life Science Department at the college that helps support the uh, lecture series. After tonight's, or at the end of tonight's lecture, the speaker would um, entertain questions for sure. And so at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to access a Q&A box. And if you just insert questions into the Q&A box towards the end of uh, the talk, we can uh, address those questions the best we can. Thank you. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Amy Erickson, who is also a faculty member at Sheridan College in the Ag and Life Science Department, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm glad that you could participate in today's lecture. It's going to be an exciting one. I can't wait to hear it. Um, I'm here to introduce Dr. Vikram Chatra, who um, is the Senior Research Scientist for the University of Wyoming's Embry Bioinformatics Corps in Laramie. Um, his background is in population genetics, where he studies forests and tries to, I'm just paraphrasing, he'll tell you more here in a second, but he'll, one of his goals is to identify biotechnological tools to help improve forest health, which is pretty important. He studies trees such as spruce, pine, and poplar, which of course we have species of here in our region. And I think some of his study sites are actually up here in Sheridan in the Dayton area. Um, as a member of the Bioinformatics Corps, he helps support other researchers develop advanced computing um, techniques to analyze their data and answer questions that they have as well. Um, as part of INBRI, I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but I talk about it all the time. Um, INBRI is a program, it's a really long acronym that stands for IDEA Network for Biomedical Research Excellence. It's long and big, um, but it's an NIH grant that not only funds the Bioinformatics Corps at UW, but funds a foundational core of researchers in, the, in Wyoming to help um, further biomedical research. And this includes the community colleges. Um, and it allows the community colleges like Sheridan and Gillette to offer undergraduate research opportunities for our students so that they get excited about research and biomedical research. And then that leads to a pathway to the University of Wyoming. And Vikram is one of those colleagues that we have to work with to help move our students um, in that direction. It's really exciting. It's a great opportunity. Um, we've worked with Vikram um, for many years. I can't, can't even remember how long ago it's been since I've met him, I think like six years ago, maybe. <laughs> anyway, four, only four, it seems like six, but it's been a great experience. Um, and he's been very helpful in um, providing training even um, for the university and the community college faculty in using things like R for statistical analysis and other coding tools to help um, with our research programs. And so it's been a great collaboration. Um, I think with that, I'll let Vikram take over and he will tell us something new and exciting, I'm sure. Great. Well, thank you, Amy and Scott, for um, that wonderful introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy week, for a busy weeknight to come listen to me. Uh, hopefully, this will all be interesting for you. Um, so as Amy mentioned, I work here at the University of Wyoming um, under a National Institute of Health uh, Research Program. It's called INBRE, which you have heard many, many times by now. Um, so my work is mainly here in biomedical research uh, in application of computer science technology to uh, large scale biological data sets. But uh, today's talk is not going to be about uh, biomedical sciences in particular, 
it's going to be about my other interest, uh, something I've trained in um, and I have gotten a PhD in. So my PhD is in population genetics and I mainly work with forest trees um, in different capacities. Um, I've worked with a wide variety of um, uh, forestry systems like conifers and angiosperms uh, of many different species. And so today's talk is more a general interest talk um, that deals with uh, the kind of problems our uh, forests are currently experiencing uh, because of many different threats and what scientists around the world or particularly in North America are doing to mitigate those challenges. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen first before I get started. Let me see if I can do that. Yes, can. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk is Climate Change and the Health of North American Forests. I changed it a little bit because I thought the other title was a little too glamorous. <laughs> and I don't know if I was going to be able to deliver on that. So um, here is a little more modest title. Um, one thing I want to point out today is that this is a really big subject. And so we are barely going to scratch the surface of many of the things that I'll cover here. And so what I'm going to do is uh, towards the end of the talk, I will provide you guys with a um, sort of a further reading list of sorts for those who are interested in learning more on this subject and what's happening in North America in order to save our forests. So I've compiled a list of um, three different things. The first being um, some prominent scientists who are active in this field who are doing research. Um, uh, and then uh, a list of uh, sort of popular science articles from newspapers and um, other sources uh, on this particular subject area. Um, and then um, a, a, a public, publicly available uh, report produced by uh, the National Academy of Sciences in 2019, which was last year, um, which I definitely urge you to read if you're, inter if you're interested in this subject. So with that, I will get started because uh, we got substantial ground to cover. Um, another thing I want to mention is because uh, this is a public lecture series, I am going to try to remain as, as little jargony and as little um, scientific as possible um, because I don't want to confuse or compl complicate these matters such that you, you won't be able to comprehend what's going on. So I'm going to try to be very, very simplistic here, but please do leave uh, questions and comments in, in the box provided over here uh, throughout the talk. Uh, we'll wait for the questions to, uh, until the end, but uh, feel free to write the questions as they come to your mind. Um, and hopefully we'll have enough time to, to deal with all the questions. So uh, these are a list of topics that I'm going to cover today. Uh, and they mainly pertain to um, maintaining healthy forest ecosystems in North America. So um, we first we deal with what constitutes a healthy forest, uh, what really the definition of a healthy forest is, and there isn't one, there are many out there. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about what sort of threats these forests are facing currently. We'll talk about some examples of trees that have suffered um, substantial damage uh, due to various uh, pests and diseases um, over the last um, several decades and even over the last century. Um, and then we will get into uh, sort of what sort of techniques are available uh, currently to mitigate these issues that we're having. So we'll look into what's causing these issues and how they can be mitigated using different methods. And so some of those methods are uh, genetic engineering, for example, which is a very contentious issue, uh, both in um, societal terms and also political terms 
and regulatory terms in the United States as well as in Canada. So we'll talk about those. Uh, and then uh, we'll also introduce a couple more methods that scientists have been using and thinking about um, in order to understand um, how we can move into the, how we can move our healthy forests into the future so that um, we can keep enjoying the benefits they offer us, um, all the ecosystem benefits that we derive from the forests. Um, also, uh, throughout the talk, there will be a couple of places uh, where I will sort of close my slides and open a browser just to show you something, maybe a website, um, or um, I, I have a small interview with a scientist that I'm going to play. I didn't do the interview, it's an interview done by NPR. It's only three minutes, but it'll be towards the end of the talk. And I hope that it'll be informative um, for you. Okay, so what is a healthy forest? There are, like I said, there are very many definitions out there of what a healthy forest is. And it really depends upon what your perspective is. So I sort of group these definitions into two different types. Uh, ones that offer an ecological perspective, so thinking through the eyes of forests, for example, or the entities that live within those for forests. And then another approach is the utilitarian approach, which is sort of thinking from a human perspective as to what we can get out of these forests and how we can maintain them in a healthy state. So um, a couple of these definitions here, um, a healthy forest is a forest that possesses the ability to sustain unique species composition and processes that exist within it. So this is a little more technical than I, I wanted to talk about here, uh, but what it basically means is um, a healthy forest is sort of an assemblage of different species in a particular state. Um, and uh, the expectation here is that that state of the forest with many different species living harmoniously is going to continue through the time. And if it does, then that's, that's, that could be called a healthy forest. Um, another type of definition is it's an assemblage of various life forms. So it includes both plants, animals, um, um, and all inter interdependent on each other. For example, the birds are dependent upon uh, various trees to for their food as well as ma for making nesting cavities and stuff like that. And then there's other animals who are interdependent in food chain, for example, but they also need the trees uh, and other plants in order to survive. So a forest that is able to maintain that sort of ecological balance um, in a, in, under environmental continuing environmental conditions is a healthy forest. Uh, and then of course, the, the utilitarian definition is what we can continue getting out of this forest. So timber, other forest products, food. Um, and if we can do that sustainably over time from a particular forest, then uh, you could call that ecosystem a healthy ecosystem. So those are some of the definitions. And then recently uh, there was a report by um, the National Academy of Sciences, which I'll talk in more detail about later in the talk, but it has adapted this definition, which is more precise and longer. So it says a condition that sustains structure. So what all things are present in the forest, um, composition, processes, functions, productivity, and resilience. The resilience part is very important. It means the ability to withstand uh, different types of disturbances um, of forest ecosystem over time and space. So that's also an important part uh, of time and space. And so there's a disclaimer in here that says an assessment of this condition is based on current state of knowledge because our knowledge base is continually getting updated because we're studying these things. And so new findings are being added. And so our perspectives might change because of that. Um, so it's based on the current state of knowledge and can be influenced by human needs, uh, cultural values and land management objectives. So it's sort of a, a, a encompassing uh, multiple attitudes and perspectives into this definition. So um, it's, a, it's a more inclusive definition, I think. 
So do we have healthy forests in North America? Of course we do. Uh, look around, all around you, even in Wyoming, there's plenty of places. Um, I have worked in many places in Wyoming, particularly um, in, the, in the Bighorn Basin. Uh, and there are a lot of areas in, in that basin where there's really nice, healthy forests. Uh, but don't let that fool you because if you travel elsewhere in Wyoming, you will see um, a lot of trees dead because of um, various pests and diseases or being destroyed due to fires. I mean, this year we had quite a few fires in, even around Laramie here uh, and in the Western part of the state. So there's a continuing danger um, that is posed to these forests. And so we shouldn't take their current existence for granted because a lot of these forests are really in grave danger of being decimated um, over the next 50 or 100 years. Uh, it might seem like a long time, but we gotta live something for um, the future generations. We owe it to them, um, just like we inherited these forests from our forefathers. Um, so I, I say that we're now in a race, really it's a race to against time to save these forests from these various threats. So uh, one of the foremost threats that people think of when they think of um, forests is of course fires and it's because it's most visible, you can clearly see it, it's all over the news. Uh, however, far, uh, fires by themselves are um, not, not so much of a danger. We really need to understand what, what is driving these fires because uh, if you study uh, the literature throughout history, uh, it has been established beyond doubt that fires are actually a necessary thing for the forests to continue, for the nutrients to be cycled. So um, the old matter uh, gets converted into nutrients that can be absorbed by the new generation of um, forest entities like plants and trees uh, and used by other uh, entities like animals. So for, fires by themselves are not such an uncommon thing. They've been present throughout the history of uh, our planet. But what is concerning is the frequency of these fires um, and uh, our inability to control them. Um, there's just, um, as we have recently seen in, um, for example, California, uh, these blazes just continue and they decimate forest after forest, uh, forest after forest. Um, and so we need to understand what is driving this. So obviously one of the most important factors driving this is the climate change. Um, so just today there was an article in New York Times about um, um, the, how fast the polar ice is melting um, than previously known. And it, it, this one shows you an average between 1981 and 2010. And then it sort of has an animation. So I'm going to sort of quit here and go to this page. You can, you can see in this animation here, um, it, it shows you a 30 year average minimum um, in yellow color, but then it shows you the duration from just this year from March 5th up until September 15th, how much ice melted. And this is very, very unusual compared to uh, you know, a long-term pattern. So uh, the climate is definitely shifting on our planet and um, the rising CO2 levels are definitely responsible for it. So I took this detour or sort of went on a tangent just to demonstrate the fact that um, we're already seeing on a global level uh, huge changes uh, in geography, in um, the, the amount of ice that's on the polar caps. Um, so this is definitely a concern and it's contributing to um, um, to the disturbances that we're seeing or the forest fires, the, the increased uh, frequency of forest fires that we're experiencing in North America and elsewhere too. Uh, there have been reports from other parts of the world as well. Um, here's another uh, sort of um, demonstration of how the temperatures have changed since let's say 1800s. Um, and so these are the two extremes. The first picture shows 
uh, coloration and there is a temperature anomaly scale at the bottom that shows you temperature change in blue from minus four to plus four, which is in red. Um, and so between 1880 and 2015, there's a huge difference, but you can see, um, so I'm going to again switch to my browser and show you uh, this animation. And you can go do this yourself also on your time, but wa watch this, it'll just take a, a few seconds to run through this animation to see how the, the yellow and the reds are getting brighter and brighter over time. And it runs in five year increments. So slowly uh, the temperatures have been rising. And then there is a dramatic shift towards the, the, the end uh, or the last 25% of the data set. So in the last few decades, the temperature has really, really shifted very fast. And, okay, and that's that. And so if you actually look at uh, sort of how much the temperature may have changed, it's only a couple degrees, uh, but it's already showing you how much devastation can even a small amount of temperature increase um, can cause. And so there have been projections for future too calculated through modeling and based on data sets like these that tell you how much the temperatures are going to increase over the next 50 or 100 years. And those estimates are two to three degrees as well. So we are definitely going to be challenged by these circumstances and uh, the, the forests are definitely going to be maladapted to their current environmental conditions or the current places where they inhabit. Um, and so these are, these are all uh, crucial problems that we need to think about. Um, so there are two types of threats. There is abiotic threats, which I just talked about. Um, um, the, the climate warming and the fires decimating our forests, but then there is an even more uh, substantial danger that has been present um, for a long time, but it's only getting worse now. And those are the biotic threats, which are caused by um, various pests and diseases. So there is a ton of insects uh, and fungi species that affect or uh, sort of infect uh, North American tree species. Um, and the examples are all around us. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. But what, what's happening is a combination of these two things. So the temperatures are rising slowly. So the climate is warming. And what that does is um, there, there is a concept called local adaptation or local uh, adaptive tolerance for each species living in a particular environment. So think of an insect which has a distribution range in North America uh, to certain parts. So imagine a map and on that map, it's superimposed a range of that particular um, distribution of that uh, insect species um, under let's say today's conditions. Now, fast forward 10 or 15 years from now, the temperatures have shifted a little bit and in other regions, where the insect was not present before, but now the environmental conditions are conducive for that insect to move to new, newer environments um, and start infecting trees present in those areas. And so what's happening with those trees is those trees did not know about this insect at all. So they are not pre-adapted. They have not seen this type of disease or this type of infection before. So they do not have evolutionarily speaking, they do not have the mechanisms or um, sort of the resistance inherent in them uh, that can help them um, uh, sort of um, defeat these insects. And so these insects are expanding their ranges and um, causing infestation in more and more trees across the landscape. This is the number one problem because of climate change. And we have seen this over and over again throughout North America with respect to many different 
um, pests and many different forest trees. Uh, and then of course, uh, this was only about, I was only talking about the native species, species here uh, of pests, but then due to globalization and global trades, um, things have been coming. We import a lot of uh, things from other countries um, um, and these pests and diseases can come from other, other regions of the world. Uh, and our forests are not used to those threats. So they do not have the defense mechanisms necessary to, to defend themselves against them. Um, and so this, this creates a perfect storm uh, which is what happened with an iconic North American tree species almost a hundred years, more than a hundred years ago. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But these are the sort of problems we have to understand and uh, try to come up with solutions um, to, to mitigate them. So uh, in 2014, uh, the US Forest Service conducted a study um, it was actually here in Fort Collins. Um, the, the authors were based here at the U.S. Forest Service in Fort Collins. And they found, they did a survey of all the threats, uh, in, uh, insect pest threats available um, or present in, in North America, particularly in the United States. And they sort of tried to come up with um, empirical numbers or quantitative numbers to determine what the risk was and how much ground cover were we going to be losing if these infestations continued. And they found that in, area, in many areas, as much as 25% of the trees uh, were susceptible to being killed by these beetles over almost 40 million hectares of forests. And you can see that it covers the entire landscape of the US. Um, and the only reason they're not showing anything in Canada because they didn't study anything there, but that doesn't mean that the threat doesn't exist in Canada. It, it exists to a great magnitude over there as well. Um, so this is the magnitude of the problem that we're facing right now. Um, and so what do we know about these pests and diseases? And this might shock you, but since 1600s, there have been 450 species of insects and 16 species of other types of pathogens like fungi uh, that have been in, introduced from outside the US or outside our continent. And they have established our continent as their new home, uh, infecting a wide range of tree species. Um, and here are some of the examples of um, these pests and some of them you might recognize. Um, so, this, this first picture, for example, is the white pine blister rust, uh, which is a very, very common disease in the Western United States uh, and also in Canada. And um, the mountain pine beetle has decimated forests in Wyoming, Montana, um, and westwards. You know, I'm sure if you go in the mountains, you will, you will see a lot of dead trees and they're usually because of the spruce beetle or the mountain pine beetle. There's the Asian longhorn beetle that uh, infects the, the ash species. Uh, so these are just a very few examples I've listed here uh, of all the diseases that, are, uh, that we're, ex we're experiencing right now and that we know about. Um, so it's, it's really grave danger. This is a picture from uh, the Snowy Range Mountains near Laramie. Uh, the Medicine Bow Route National Forest. You can see lots of dead spruces here. Uh, the bark beetles or the mountain pine beetles, wherever the pines are dead. Uh, more in Colorado where the lodgepole, lodgepole pine is very common. Here's another example from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, I used to live in Tennessee in the 2000s and um, even then when I visited the Smoky Mountain National Park, I have seen this devastation in person. Lots and lots of hemlock trees dead, completely stripped of their greenness, completely dead, and just standing like skeletons. Uh, it's such a ghostly sight to see, uh, as you can see here. At least there is some spatter, smattering of um, green, greenness over here, uh, but there are some stands where you will see only dead trees 
and nothing else. And that's caused by the hemlock woolly adulgid. That's the name of the insect. Uh, for example, this picture is not showing up for some reason, but it was a picture of um, a forest in Wisconsin um, that was decimated by the emerald ash borer. So ash trees are very prized. The wood is very prized. It's hardwood. It's an angiosperm species uh, used in furniture making. Uh, it's one of the keystone species in the forests uh, in the eastern part of the country or the continent. Um, and these, these emerald ash borer insects, I will show you their picture. This green one at the bottom left here, that insect is causing all kinds of devastation in, the, in, these, uh, in the ash species. Um, in the eastern part of the part of the country. So that brings us to a, a story um, that happened almost, or that started almost more than 100 years ago in 1890s. Um, the American chestnut, I don't know if any of you have seen a large American chestnut. There is just maybe a few individuals left here and there, but it used to be a massive, fast-growing tree that had lots of uses. It was culturally important to, for example, Native Americans. It was used widely in the timber industry because the wood was light and it was um, it had a nice golden yellowish hue. Um, so, and of course, the chestnuts, um, the fruit, uh, was edible, and people actually made uh, the Native Americans actually made flour out of it. It, it had huge cultural significance. And this tree was present um, over a large landscape going from Maine to Mississippi to Florida. And there is about three different species of um, chestnut. The, the main one um, has a scientific name, Castanea dentata, which is what we call American chestnut. But then there is also other two, which is, um, uh, I think Allegheny chinkapin, that's the common name for Castanea pumila. And the Ozark chinkapin, which is uh, Castanea ozarkensis. And so, ranges of all these three species are shown here. Um, the region that looks sort of in between the red and blue here is, is looking that way just because the ranges overlap there, uh, which means that both species are present in that area. So, it had a huge cultural and economic significance. Um, it has lot. It had lots of medicinal uses. Native Americans used it in for its medicinal properties, um, and it was one of the keystone species in the forest. There were like four billion or so trees across this entire landscape. That's a huge number. And then, sometime in 1890s or around that time, a non-native fungus that that is common in East Asia. It's called uh, Cryphonectria parasitica or chestnut blight. Uh, came in some shipping containers um, uh, to the US and it infected the first tree towards the end of the 19th century. The first report of a known infection was at the New York Bot Botanical Garden in 1904. That was the first report. Uh, and then by 1910, the disease had spread uh, and it was causing a lot of panic because trees were dying left and right. Uh, the, the, the American chestnut, such a humongous species, but just did not have the native resistance required uh, to fight against a disease like this. So, uh, at the peak of their distribution, there were about 4 billion trees, as I said. Um, by 1950s, most of them had been, kill had been killed. Um, it was just a barren landscape remaining after they had left. And the fungus is so potent that uh, even if the seeds were sort of uh, able to start new seedlings or saplings, uh, the, the trees will not be able to withstand the blight so they will almost always remain in shrub form. So by 1950s, almost all the trees had been either killed or been reduced to simply being really small saplings. And so 
it caused a huge devastation across the landscape. This is really a eye-opening um, sort of incidents that span decades in the in the United States, um, and a lot of people uh, and many governmental agencies like U.S. Forest Service try to mitigate this by um, first they try to sort of make a hybrid between Chinese chestnut and American chestnut. That didn't work. They didn't grow here. Uh, they were not adapted to these conditions, so. Um, that was not able to work. And so people tried many different things, but nothing worked. And so the question is, how to mitigate these problems? Um, I sort of went backwards into this. I meant to start with the chestnut story first because it's so remarkable. Uh, but now we have talked about both the chestnut and what can really happen in the worst of the circumstances. Um, and we're facing circumstances similar to that now with other species. And so we need to find solutions to these problems. What can we do? And there are many methods and some are contentious, some are uh, sort of objectionable or controversial. Um, and so that brings us to genetic engineering. I'm sure uh, many of you have known about genetic engineering. Um, the products of genetic engineering are all around us, as you can see in this picture here. Uh, one of the first experiments done with um, genetic engineering, which is simply a technique that allows you to insert a foreign segment of DNA from one species into another. Uh, so it carries a sort of a character or a trait from one species into another. And we have used that uh, in crops, for example, to improve their disease resistance. There is um, uh, tomatoes that can stay hardy much longer on the table now after you buy them from the grocery stores if they're genetically modified. Uh, they also grow bigger than your regular wild varieties. Uh, there's cotton, there's corn, soybean, potatoes. A lot of these things have been genetically modified. Uh, one of the first experiments was inserting a firefly gene into a tobacco plant, which is what they're showing here. And that was just for experimental purpose. I mean, nobody wants to see a glowing tobacco plant unless it's Halloween uh, and not even then. Uh, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to show here is genetic engineering is one of the methods that has been proposed um, to sort of work around the problem of forest health and the problem of all of these diseases. Um, and so um, this is uh, Professor William Powell. He works at State University of New York, I believe in Syracuse. He was um, a key person in sort of solving the, the American chestnut disease resistance problem. And um, this is how the story went. So the key potent ingredient in the chestnut blight fungus is called oxalic acid. That's the compound that makes it possible for the, for the fungus to infect the tree and uh, make it decay, make the tissues decay uh, and ultimately kills the tree. Um, and so Dr. Powell went out and looked for things that could neutralize oxalic acid. And so there was a compound present in nature called oxalate oxidase. It's able to neutralize the oxalic acid produced by the chestnut blight fungus. Um, so many plants actually naturally produce that compound, uh, including wheat. And so what Dr. Powell did was, or what his lab did was, they took that gene or that segment of DNA identified in wheat as responsible for making the oxalate oxidase protein. Uh, they excise that DNA segment and through the process of genetic engineering, which involves using the E. coli bacterium through plasmids and um, rapid multiplication, they inserted that gene into uh, embryos of uh, chestnut plants or chestnut trees. And it took two decades for them to get that process working. But they eventually managed to genetically engineer 
that V gene producing this particular compound, which can confer resistance to um, um, uh, the chestnut blight fungus in chestnut trees. And so eventually they were successful. And now it's a well-known fact that there are chestnut trees growing um, in very controlled conditions because the US government has not allowed these scientists to release it in, in, in the wild populations yet. Um, and that's not gonna happen for a while. But uh, just the fact that we can do this is promising and we have to consider other things. Uh, of course, chestnut was not the only example here. Um, it was the biggest example because chestnut was such an icon, iconic tree on uh, the forest landscapes of America. Uh, so it got a lot of publicity, but there is also another tree, uh, the eucalyptus, which is a, mainly a tropical tree. Um, and obviously when you grow it in the US, even in the Southern US, uh, it has a problem with uh, freeze tolerance which it did not have before, but there is a company called Arborgen in the US. Actually, it's a multinational company now. They produced a clone of um, eucalyptus that is able to withstand temperatures of up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold. Um, and so the goal was to use this in um, sort of plantation forestry to increase more biomass production um, in the south southeastern U.S., and of course, all of these examples. So the trees, ex the genetically modified trees, exist, uh, but um, you know there are a lot of issues. So, in general, GMOs is a very charged issue, both socially and ethically, culturally, uh, and then there is a lot of money involved in it, and there are other scientific considerations. So uh, all of these developments sort of raised a lot of questions. Uh, and so after many long years, um, uh, one of the premier scientific institutions or bodies in, in the US, uh, the National Academy of Sciences conducted a study uh, that sort of focused on the impacts of using biotechnology to improve forest health. And they produced this report, it's called a consensus study report. This report is available for free to download from the National Academy's press website. I encourage you to um, go and uh, take a look at it if you're interested. Uh, you can also buy a printed copy, but the, the online version, the PDF version is available for reading for anybody for free. Um, so uh, the report makes a lot of recommendations for using best practices for improving forest health in, in the face of a variety of threats. And so um, these are just recommendations and then the regulatory agencies in the US like the Environmental Protection Agency or the USDA Forest Service, and there are many others. Uh, they will ultimately determine whether to allow these GMO trees uh, to be deployed in natural landscapes. But genetic engineering is really not the only thing that's available to us. There are other methods. Uh, for example, finding natural resistance to diseases in natural populations of trees. And so th this is a US Forest Service lab run by Jennifer Koch um, in Ohio. And they found some green ash trees that were able to survive the beetle, beetle infestation. And so they will use that as a reforestation stock to breed the next generation of trees to be deployed in, in, in the forests. So that, that's one example. And then there is another concept called the assisted migration of trees. Uh, this is a really fascinating concept, and it's primarily developed by uh, Professor Sally Aiken. Uh, she works at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and she has a long-running project called Adapt Tree. Um, they work on lots of conifers as well as on poplars. Uh, but uh, instead of me explaining her work to you here, I'm going to run a very small three-minute clip uh, of an interview she did with NPR. Um, with Rene Montaigne, uh, and uh, let's listen to that and see see what she has to say about this. It's only three minutes. Experiment to save some endangered trees from the impacts of climate change, moving them. It's called assisted migration. Scientists around the world are trying it with other plants and animals as well. Sally Aiken is a plant geneticist at the University of British Columbia, 
Seven years ago, she planted the seeds of a tree that was hurting as its environment warmed to a place closer to its traditional habitat. She says those seeds have now grown into seedlings at a normal rate. She joined us from Vancouver. Good morning. Good morning, Renee. Tell us about the white bark pine. That is the tree. Um, and I gather it's endangered. Yes, white bark pine is a very special species that we find at high elevations. It's usually the uppermost tree line species in the West. It's involved with the grizzly bear food. It's dispersed by a single bird species and it stabilizes snowpacks and uh, plays many ecological roles in those environments. So it does all those things and, and yet now it is trying to survive in a warmer environment, which has changed what to make it endangered? Well, it's suffering from many challenges. The first is an introduced disease called white pine blister rust. The second is the mountain pine beetle that's really expanded due to warmer winter temperatures. And the third is the effect of warming climate on other species that are competing with it. Seven years later, how is the white bark pine doing in its new home, which is where? So it, the new homes we put them in are up to 500 miles north of the natural range. And the last time they were visited, uh, some of those trees were doing quite well. We need to reassess them and see if they have continued to do well, survive and grow. This would seem to be controversial, partly because many scientists are very concerned about introducing species outside their environment. Are you worried that the white bark pine could itself someday become invasive? The white bark pine specifically is quite unlikely to become highly invasive. It's a very slow growing and very slow to reproduce tree and it's growing in, in very cold environments that don't favor much growth and reproduction. Now you mentioned a, a bird and um, this I gather, uh, the seeds of the white bark pine are usually spread by this bird called a Clark's nutcracker. What if everything goes well? Would the next step be to introduce the birds into the area where you've transplanted the trees? Well, it's an interesting thing that the birds have not already moved white bark pine farther north. So these climates, there are areas that the climate has been favorable in the past for white bark, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And that probably is to do with the bird. I don't think we're going to be moving the birds, but if we made the decision to establish populations farther north, the birds may move into those areas and then assist with further dispersal. Still, it is a dramatic image of the future. That is <laughs> trees being helped to move. It is absolutely, and trees can migrate species ranges. They've done that since the last ice age maybe 100 yards a year at the fastest, but it's not fast enough to keep up with climate change. Really, the white bark pine is one example of what we might have to do on a much larger scale, uh, moving species farther north into these areas that they can't disperse into and establish in quickly enough. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. You're very welcome. Sally Aiken is head of the Center. Yeah, so, um... Assisted migration is um, definitely the new big thing after genetic engineering um, to sort of uh, mitigate uh, the, the warming climate and its effect on natural populations of forest trees. So we're sort of running very close to, I've actually run over time. So I'm going to stop here uh, and I'm going to uh, quickly show you that um, I have written a small article here or sort of a glossary or a collection of things uh, for the reading resources on this topic. If any of you are interested in accessing this, I will be putting this on my website. So uh, my website is actually listed uh, at the front here. It's vc.popgen.org. If you go here, uh, it'll be under news and highlights. And I when I post it tonight, it'll be at the very top of this listing. So if you click on that, you will be able to access this list. And uh, the reason I want to do it that way instead of giving you a PDF or emailing it to you is because I'm going to continually update this list. And so you may come back to it from time to time um, and there may be more information added to it. So um, 
do make a note of my website so you can you can check it out later or contact uh, uh, Scott or Amy and they can uh, hook you up with that. So with that, I'm going to go and look at the Q&A box here um, and see if I can answer any of your questions. Uh, would you consider Japanese beetle as another potential problem for our area? Yes. Um, I have not looked at the, spe the specific species that you're talking about here of the Japanese beetle. Uh, but yes, there, there, there are any insect species or especially beetles. Now we already know that they're able to infect our forests. Um, and so we have to keep an eye on, uh, I'm sure the USDA Forest Service and the EPA are already keeping an eye out on uh, many of these threats. Thank you for that question. Are there any chestnut trees left? Great question. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, there are a few examples and I, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head right now, but if you search online, uh, you will find examples of very, very few chestnut trees that survived the chestnut blight. Um, and there, there's, of course, the other two chinkapins that I mentioned and showed the ranges of. Uh, some of those might have also survived. So you, you might want to look up the American Chestnut Foundation's website, which I list in this in here. Actually, I show it here. Uh, it's called tacf.org, their website. Uh, has a ton of information. That foundation has been around since 1980s. Um, so, and there, there is people you can talk to um, in the foundation to get more information. How long have they been able to genetically engineer these plants? So uh, the concept of genetically engineering anything really started, I think in the 1980s. So we found out the structure of DNA in 1950s, which won a Nobel prize for uh, those two guys, forget their names now. <laughs> uh, but the, the real genetic engineering started in 1980s after um, sort of the polymerase chain reaction was discovered. Um, and so uh, all these developments in, in genetic engineering of plants are pretty new. I would say in the last, most of it has happened in the last 20 to 25 years. Could the assisted migration and genetic engineering methods bring back extinct species of trees? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, in order for us to bring back anything that's already extinct, you would need to have access to its genome in some way or form. Like for example, they show in Jurassic Park that there was an amber capsule that contained a mosquito that had just beaten um, a dinosaur or a T-Rex, um, and it was preserved in the amber as soon as uh, it had sort of sucked that blood out of the out of the T-Rex. And so the blood cells were preserved and the genome was able to be sequenced properly. I don't know if you can say the same thing about a lot of trees that have gone extinct um, uh, or, or if they're about to go extinct, you could sort of put them in some sort of bank and maybe in future we'll be able to um, resurrect them, so to speak. Uh, but it's not as simple as simply knowing assisted migration and genetic engineering to, to bring back a species. I mean, we have not been able to bring back the woolly mammoth, although people have talked about it for years. And so uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be as simple as it would be my answer to that question. Um, so uh, what do you feel are the promising techniques for forest restoration and preservation? So uh, if you look at the, the National Academy's report and their recommendations, you will notice that they rely as much on uh, the traditional methods of um, sort of maintaining healthy forests, like um, uh, stopping the spread of uh, invasive species, for example, uh, restoring the habitats. Um, and so those methods are prominently sort of encouraged in the report, in their recommendations. 
So I would say that uh, those are the sort of techniques, um, keeping the habitats suitable for the species uh, that are already adapted to them, slowing the spread of invasive species, or if you can completely wipe them out. Um, and then just really keeping tabs on what comes in from other continents into North America. Uh, and that's easier said than done, but that's definitely one way of, of doing things. Uh, now lots of questions are popping up. I'm trying to catch up. Are there any other plans that you know of that genetic engineering could bring back species? Not off the top of my head. Um, I mean, we have certainly, or the, the, the warming climate has certainly decimated a lot of species, but has not made them go extinct yet. So I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but I'm sure there, there are examples out there. Uh, what, excellent question, what could the average layperson do to contribute to forest health? So I wanna speak a little about citizen science here. Uh, there was recently an article in New York Times about how citizens, especially during this pandemic, can actually help scientists do their work using citizen science. So there's a lot of projects. One of the most prominent projects is the National Phenology Network. Uh, if you go to their website, uh, you will find uh, information on how you can contribute to their efforts. They keep track of all the uh, sort of the life cycle of plants. Um, so for example, all across the, the continent, people monitor the trees in their backyards. Um, and then they write down, oh, this was the, in, in this particular year, this was the day in spring when the buds, the leaf buds, for example, started opening um, and so on and so forth. So citizens keep track at a very detailed level um, of what's happening in their backyard. They take that data and submit it to the scientists. Scientists curate that data from a large number of people um, across, let's say, uh, the continent, and then they come up with uh, a nice analysis that gives them or shows them the bigger picture. Uh, a very fine example, and this is not about forestry, but uh, you may have heard of a website called eBird run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have a citizen science project uh, where you report the, the bird counts and stuff like that. So there is a lot you can do uh, as a layperson uh, to contribute to uh, to science. And um, I encourage you to, to look into all those options. Oh, and if you contact me, I can put you in touch with uh, uh, people who actually do work in forestries. So um, there are citizen science projects out there that you can um, help with. Uh, Uh, how are the major forest fires in the West affecting us here in Wyoming? Yes, um, so I assume that you, uh, by West, you're talking about California, for example. Uh, I mean, we already saw this year that our climate was sort of, um, we had a lot of um, smoke coming into our region from um, all the way from California. In fact, I heard on the news that it went all the way to Nebraska. Uh, so that's definitely one effect. Now you can imagine that if these fires continue to burn throughout the summer, for example, and our sky co is covered with this black suit um, for extended periods of time, that is definitely going to affect the productivity of forests in Wyoming. Because let's face it, we need lots of sunlight in order to make more and more biomass. Um, and so that might also make our trees susceptible to, to these diseases because they're so, sort of not in the healthiest state, so to speak. So excellent question. Let me see. Um, what led you, what led to your interest in this topic? Um, thanks for that question. So I've been a forest biologist for a very long time. I started in India actually. Um, I got my master's degree in botany in India. Um, 
And then my first assignment or sort of my first fellowship was um, for a research project working on Norway spruce uh, in Sweden. And so that, that was the beginning of my career as a forest biologist. Uh, and somehow I've always been fascinated by, by forests like many of you are, which is why you're here today. Uh, and I sort of kept up with that passion and um, one opportunity led to another. And so I've worked with, uh, I've worked at um, nine or 10 different institutions now in several different countries, um, in most cases working with forest trees. Um, and so I'm sort of fascinated by um, large natural populations of forest trees. Uh, and they just, um, there are so many questions that we, one can answer. Uh, and that's really uh, my main motivation behind uh, studying the forest trees. I don't get to do that as much anymore because the nature of my job here is that 90% of my work is helping other people do science in Wyoming, mostly in biomedical sciences. So that about remaining 10% is where I use. And I use that time to sort of go in the forests and collect uh, samples for DNA extraction and stuff like that. So I actually have been in big horns um, two years in a row now. And if I'm around next year, I will definitely come back there again. It's a beautiful forest. Thank you for the question. To what significance can the rise of urbanization impact forest ecosystems and forest health? This is a very contentious issue. Uh, the cities are expanding um, towards the forest. A lot of forest is being cut down across the nation um, to make way for developments, urban, not just urban developments, but also industrial developments. A huge concern. Uh, not so much a concern yet, I would say, maybe in the United, in the in the Western United States, where the federal, um, where a large proportion of the land is owned by a federal government. But then there are other things like you know uh, the drilling, for example, for oil and gas, which is expanding now more rapidly. Even in national monuments, uh, permits have been issued for drilling and. Um, um, extracting natural gases. So I, I think until and unless our society sort of has a change of heart and makes a decision to stop using fossil fuels and invest in renewable energy, um, and renewable energy has its own problems, obviously. Uh, but until that happens, I don't think the tide is going to turn and it's definitely a concern. Uh, What is a forest in the United States that impresses you more than others as far as being the most beneficial to our environment? I'm not sure if I understand this question. Are you perhaps saying, where is my favorite forest in the United States? I don't know if you can submit another question as a follow-up. But if that is your question, um, I do not have a, a favorite forest. I like all forests for their unique characteristics. Though I would say that I've really enjoyed living in Vermont, which is where I was before I came here. Um, now here, I have to drive at least um, 10 miles in that direction towards east to go to Happy Jack or 45 minutes to the west to get into the, the snowy range to see the forest. Uh, and I really miss the combination of um, sort of rivers and lakes and forests, which is hard to come by in this part of the world. Um, I, I guess that's all I will say about that. More questions? Uh, Amy and Scott, uh, I'm happy to stay longer, but how, how long should we continue? I say we could take maybe it looks like we've got one more question, maybe two more questions and then okay. wrap it up there. Okay. Oh, interesting question. Have you read any research 
in regard to old growth or old growth forestries to gauge whether climate events have happened in the past? Excellent question. So yes, um, there is actually a branch of biology or tree science. It's called dendrochronology, which is also a study of tree rings. Um, and there is, a, there is a laboratory of uh, tree ring research at Arizona State University, I believe. And actually, there is a connection to Wyoming. There is a new faculty at um, uh, Northwest College in Powell. Uh, her name is Emily Schultz. She just did a postdoctoral fellowship um, at the Tree Ring Research Lab Laboratory. And I mentioned tree rings because by studying the tree rings, you can actually see, with, so each ring represents one growing season um, in the cross section of the tree trunk. By sort of measuring the depth or the width of the, uh, or the size of the individual rings, you can sort of determine how good or bad the growing season was in that particular year. So you can accurately pinpoint to that particular location back in the day um, and see, so that should answer your question. And so some of the greatest trees or example trees to study this in are, um, what's the name of that tree? Uh, I forget now, but these, these trees live a very, very long life, almost four or 5,000 years. So if you take their cross section, don't try to do this because you will kill a very old tree. Um, but people have done that mistake and they have found out how old these trees were. Uh, they mostly inhabit the White Mountains in California. I'm, the, the name is just here, but it's not coming to my mouth. Um, if I remember it, I'll, I'll let you know. But yes, it is possible to study tree rings and go back in time to, to determine how the climate was back in the day. Okay, one more question. Uh, when will you be posting this on your website if you are? Um, by that, I hope I assume that you mean this list I'm displaying here. Uh, I will try to put it on tonight, but if I forget, I'll definitely do that tomorrow morning. Um, and I will make a, a note to myself. Uh, on my calendar so I don't forget. Uh, otherwise, Scott will remind me. <laughs> uh -huh. And so just uh, make a note of my website. It's vc.popgen.org. If you go there, you will see it. Um, and so I guess uh, th there are still some more questions and I'm going to see if I can copy paste them and maybe answer them later. But uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk and for asking all these wonderful questions. Yes, thank you, Vikram, very much for, uh, for a great talk tonight. Thanks, everybody in the audience, for your questions and for your attendance. And uh, just a note that we, we did record the presentation, and that will be posted.